Hello guys, Winston here, and it feels like it's been forever since my last upload. Two trips out to California in the past month will do that to you, but during those trips I had a lot of time to ponder and plan out how to attack this 5-axis project I've been thinking about for literally months now. You see, I developed a love affair with podcasts relatively recently, but my problem is that it's difficult to listen to them in the shower, my phone speakers aren't loud enough to be heard from the counter, and my primary phone isn't water resistant enough to bring into the shower with me. Right now, my workaround is to bring a cheap, expendable Android phone into the shower with me, and that means my play history isn't synced between devices. I know, this is a terrible first world problem, right? So I got my hands on a DIY Bluetooth speaker kit from online where all you need to do is build an enclosure for the speaker and control board. This is great for me because it lets me get my hands dirty and make something personalized and unique without touching the scary electronic bits. But I wasn't about to make a simple box, drill two holes in it, shove the kit components in the holes and call it a day. No, my enclosure had to be CNC machined. And after drawing inspiration from various voice assistants, I decided to make an omnidirectional down-firing speaker. I drew up an egg-shaped tower, hollowed it out, and added a cone in the middle to help encourage sound to radiate outwards. At this scale, it's probably more aesthetic than functional, but it was a cool detail I wanted to include for sure, and it would make the toolpathing strategy a little more fun later. Now, some key dimensions are as follows. My stock was going to be a 3x3 inch square turning blank, so the diameter of the speaker had to be less than 3 inches. I aimed for 2.9 inches to allow 50 thou of margin on either side, just in case my stock wasn't centered perfectly on the pocket NC. The speaker, battery, and control board sandwich need at least 2 inches of space in the enclosure. The speaker also has to be no more than 4 and an eighth inches tall, because anything longer won't be machinable on the pocket NC. I found that out the hard way. Now, modeling this up wasn't all that difficult, it's just to revolve some pattern cuts and strategically sized and placed features. The tool pathing is where my confidence faltered. I'll give you guys a brief overview of how I attacked this piece, and keep in mind that what I'm showing off are the final tool pads I ended up with. My version history for this project is basically a series of edits and fixes that accumulated over time as I crashed or otherwise ran into limitations of the pocket NC. I did not hit a home run on the first try, and I don't want you guys to have that impression. So first step in the cam process is the setup. I assumed I was starting with a 3x3 inch bar of stock surrounding my enclosure. You can do this either through the options in the stock tab or by selecting a body you've created as a placeholder. The origin, as always, needs to be set at the center of rotation of the B-table model. Toolpath 1 is a facing operation on the positive Y face of my enclosure. My speaker is 4.125 inches tall, but my stock might be between 4.15 and 4.2 inches tall, and this model is upside down for a reason you'll see later. Toolpath 2 is an adaptive clear to rough out the top inch of the setup or bottom of the enclosure. Then I'll contour out this square pocket that I'll be using for work holding purposes on the flip side. We're also adding a hole to accept a quarter inch screw. Second to last operation is still using an eighth inch square end mill, and that's to clean up the bottom face of the enclosure using a low step over pocketing toolpath. And finally, I applied a flow toolpath to the bottom 5 eighths of an inch of my enclosure. Once this is flipped over, I won't be able to get an end mill this close to the bottom again. The way I'm containing this toolpath is by using a patch that's a subset of the outer surface. Before we get to the cam on the flip side, let's see how this first half plays out. But before we get to the actual machining, we need to figure out how to hold a fat block of wood on the pocket NC. The baby vise they included with the machine just won't cut it. The ER40 collet they offer won't work either unless you have a lathe you can turn a little 1 inch diameter nub down in. My original thought was to make a platform I could screw the block into, then chuck up that platform in the ER40 collet, but as it turns out, I couldn't afford even the quarter inch of thickness added by this adapter. So I machined an aluminum adapter that would sit inside the ER40 collet and allow a bolt to pass through. On one end, there would be a square shoulder that would help prevent rotation of any pieces seated on it. This was machined with a facing operation, adaptive clear, contour finish, and multi-axis swarf operation for chamfering. Very straightforward, except for maybe the danger close ultra thin tab I left at the bottom when it came time to part off my adapter. Man, that is satisfying to watch. Except we still have a problem. This adapter needs to allow a bolt to pass through it, and the pocket NC just doesn't have the juice to drill through solid 6061 with a quarter inch drill bit. No matter, I have a drill press. Wait, no I don't. Guess I'm doing this by hand. Dang it. Well, that sucked. At least that dumb little MDF jig helped keep my hole centered. You can see from the top that my alignment was off by just a fraction of an inch over two and a half inches of drilling. Not bad for doing it by hand. 
Anyhow, since I'm starting off with a blank slate and I don't have a square socket to see it on my adapter, I have to bolt my block directly to the B-table and hope that there's enough friction to keep it in place. Because my part is so tall, you specifically need to use a short tool holder in the pocket NC. Otherwise, the Z-axis can't retract far enough back to clear the piece. Even still, I ran into some minor issues, like when my first set of operations finished and the machine returned to home, the corner of my stock crashed into the base. I ended up having to stop my program at the very end and manually choreograph the machine's return to home. I could have also done this by adding some hand-coded G-code at the end of my program, but I didn't want to mess with a text editor. Another issue I ran into was that my original flow toolpath came in purely horizontally, but the y-axis doesn't lower far enough for me to be able to hit the top of my stock, so I ended up using forward tilt to pitch the top edge of my stock within range of my end mill. This is actually a good thing because you don't want to be cutting surfaces with the tip of a ball end mill. It's got zero radius and thus zero tangential velocity. The outer edges of a ball end mill are what you want in contact with your part because that's where it'll actually be cutting. And boom, we have half a speaker enclosure. Well, more like an eighth, but at least we can now securely fasten this the other way around. Alright, back to Fusion 360. Cam in this orientation starts with a contour operation to cut out a big cavity where the speaker guts are going to go. This has to be done with a quarter inch end mill because I don't have anything else long enough to cut two inches deep. Then I'll flatten the top rim with a pocketing operation in case it's not already perfectly level. Lastly, I'll use a 3D pocketing operation to clear out some of the stock near the top because I now know that I can't hit that part of the stock from the side. Then we'll switch gears, 8th inch long reach end mill coming in from the sides. First we 3D pocket from both positive and negative Z, that removes the majority of the remaining stock in the enclosure. I've locked these operations within a containment sketch to keep them from going out of bounds. Then we come in with a pocketing operation at 60, 120, 240, and 300 degrees off axis. The containment boundary here will be the contours of the openings. I'll use rest machining where possible so that we're not cutting as much air, but the algorithm isn't perfect since it doesn't see that the core of the enclosure has already been hollowed out. So I'll offset the bottom height so I waste less time cutting air. Finally, to clean up that cone in the middle, I'll come in with parallel tool paths from all six sides. And that leaves us with just the outer surface to finish. I'm going back to flow using the same tricks as before to ensure I can actually touch the entire surface. Forward tilt of about 45 degrees and sideways tilt of 15 degrees because I can. We're restricting this to a patch covering just the upper section of the enclosure. And that wraps up that. Let's cue the machining montage. Whoa, hold up, why did that throw an error? Hmm, z-axis out of bounds, let's look at that in Fusion. Okay, so my retract and clearance heights were all set relative to the top extent of my stock. Since my stock was programmed in as a square prism, the corners of the stock have pushed my effective top height way out from the body of my enclosure. If I switch my heights to reference the model and not the stock, we should be good to go. There, that looks much better. One thing I needed to look out for was my puck of material in the headspace of my enclosure. I cut it out with a contour operation to save time and make less sawdust, but as soon as the enclosure is hollowed out from below, it's going to be unsupported. So I have to make sure this block doesn't fall into my enclosure and jam the spindle. Holy cow, that actually worked. It's not perfect though, I should have had some overlap in my containment patches for flow, there's a little bump where the two tool paths meet. I'll just have to sand that out along with any machining marks. And damn it Winston, stop trying to use old sandpaper. Fresh sandpaper literally pays for itself in terms of time saved. Thank you.
All right, final stretch, I think. Let's put a healthy coating of spray poly on this thing. Normally, I think about hand rubbed oil and maybe some wax for a piece like this. Who am I kidding? I've never made anything like this before, but spalted maple, smooth contours, that's just begging for a natural smooth finish in my opinion. However, since the speaker will be blasting podcasts in my humid bathroom, I'm going with a more protective polyurethane coat. And now I just need to integrate the electronics. Hmm, that's weird. I could have sworn these were two inches in di- Ugh. Measure once, cut twice. These bezels make the speakers 2.1 inches in diameter, not two. Fantastic. Well, the top cap doesn't need any modification since it can sit proud of the enclosure, but the speaker needs to go on a diet because it has to fit through this hole. So I'll just make a hole in some MDF, seat the speaker in there, and trim around the edges. Problem solved. And now we can finally integrate. I'll make some 2-inch rings to go between the speaker parts and the enclosure and press fit everything in place. It actually fits so tight that I didn't need to use glue. This has been one heck of a project. I've never been dealt so many setbacks yet relished the challenge so much. The reason I was so adamant about approaching this as a 5-axis project was for the education. I want to be a better machinist and that means I need to try new things and push myself outside my comfort zone. I will readily admit that I had to look back at my Turner's Cube project files and video to recall my workflow for the Pocket NC. Using this machine isn't second nature for me yet and the only way that'll improve is through experience. And on that note, I want to thank you guys all very much for following along as I fumble my way through the 5-axis workflow and putting up with my video hiatus while I was in California. I'll be back with another CNC related project video in a week or two. P.S. If you want to see what I was up to while I was in California, check out my second channel. and put together a meetup at this little brew pub that was really fun. We had probably, I don't know, a dozen, 15 people show up, and it was super short notice. Uh, so that was cool. You know, had a beer and hung out with some people that I'd never met, talked about Shape Co.